So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College and um, thrilled to, to have you here for the uh, first, uh, first in the series of Tough Talks for this semester. Um, one of the things I love about the Tough Talks is that it's a student run series and I'm gonna let the students um, uh, jump in here in a sec. I just wanna say that uh, this series has now been going on for about three years at Bard through the RN Center. Um, it's dedicated to bringing people whose uh, whose opinions and uh, and their courageous articulation of their opinions are often um, not in the mainstream of the opinion at Bard College. Sometimes maybe are, sometimes not, but the idea is that they're not usually. And that means that uh, this is an opportunity for us to have um, a frank and, and serious and thoughtful conversation that requires a, a certain amount of respect and listening to each other. And on, I've been incredibly uh, pleased and awed by the students at Bard over the last three years that we've done this and the way we've uh, created these kind of real special space for having these kind of difficult conversations. So I welcome you. And now I'd like to introduce one of our Tough Talk fellows uh, we have a few fellows every year who meet uh, and select the, the speakers that we're going to invite with us. And um, uh, tonight, I, I'd like to introduce uh, Rosie Levy, who is a student fellow with Tough Talks. Uh, she's, I think, been almost, this is her second year at Tough Talks. She's a senior in philosophy, and she's interested in, in meaning, meaning, a, meaning a political philosophy, I'm sorry. She's interested in political philosophy. So Rosie, uh, you're up, thanks very much. Thanks Roger, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so the Tough Talks lecture series, it's an initiative for our community to critically consider controversial ideas, um, to be able to better hold accountable our own thinking. I came across Vicki Osterweil's writing, writing this past semester and it really challenged me and pushed me to reevaluate how I myself might think and live and act. Um, so I'm really, really pleased to be able to introduce you, her to you this evening. Vicki Oster is the writer, editor, and agitator based in Philadelphia. Her work has appeared in Real Life, The New Inquiry, Al Jazeera, America, Descent, The Baffler, and The Paris Review. Uh, today, she will be speaking about the simplistic narrative that a good, successful, nonviolent civil rights movement in the South gave way to a misguided Northern violent Black power movement, and how this affects not only our understanding of that period, but our perspectives on modern social movement activity in America. Additionally, she will discuss how nonviolence is a fundamentally incoherent and vague way of thinking about liberation, abolition, abolition, or revolution in order to help us think more clearly and bravely about what change means and requ requires. So please now welcome Vicki Osterweil. Hi, thank you all so much. Um, it's, such a, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here talking with you. Um, just wanna quickly acknowledge that um, I'm speaking from uh, the land of the Leni Lenape people um, here in so-called Philadelphia. Um, before I begin. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it. We've got some slides here um, and uh, and yeah, and then uh, there we go, I guess. All right, let me uh, let me share these for you. Hang on one second. Oh, obviously, of course, I immediately pressed the wrong button, which is very helpful to everyone. Okay, um, let's go here. All right. Okay, um, so I wanna start this talk by calling on everyone to remember um, that despite the elections, the pandemic and the white riot at the Capitol, um, that last year uh, we lived through by many metrics, the largest uprising in United States history. Um, we are, I believe, uh, in a period of a third reconstruction, um, a third epochal moment when this system built upon the pillars of uh, new world settler colonialism and plantation capitalism are being shaken to their core by the black freedom struggle on the move. Amplified and intersecting with fights for decolonization, disabled revolution, queer liberation, and abolition of the borders, cages, and cops that stand in the way. Um, it will take historians, I think, decades to properly analyze and contextualize the George Floyd uprisings, which, was in, which were in many ways, I think, the culmination, and then we'll talk about this a bit later, the culmination of a decade of um, growing revolt both within the United States um, and globally. Um, 
this is the case, uh, despite the fact that I think in my estimation, um, we are also only in the beginning of the middle of a decades long period of restructuring and transformation, uh, perhaps even revolution. Um, the revolt uh, in 2020 uh, forced the president of the United States to hide in a bunker underneath the White House while rioters stormed the gates. Um, we watched or perhaps helped uh, burn police cars and precincts, parole offices, courts and federal buildings. Um, we saw racist monuments toppled. Um, that's up in the top right, that's Philly's uh, racist monument that, that went down during the movement. Um, uh, we saw big box stores, pawn shops and gentro boutiques emptied, torched and destroyed in almost every state and major city in the country um, over the first few weeks of the uprising. I start this way um, because the horror of the pandemic uh, and the unfolding drama of resurgent fascism and ecological collapse can leave us feeling empty, uh, defeated, isolated, and hopeless. Um, I know it has for me uh, many times this winter, um, but there is actually a tremendous amount of liberatory energy and possibility on the horizon. I think we're really in a period of, of fundamental change right now. Um, but I also wanna stress it because much of the US left seems to have decided to ignore the uprising um, along with its antecedents in Oakland and Ferguson and Baltimore, in New York, in the California prison system, and in Standing Rock in their analysis. Maybe it's because those who led those struggles uh, were not the left orgs, the activists and the nonprofits, the politicians, professional and amateur, um, the academics, the podcasters, the hot takers, all of whom trailed well behind the movement, um, trying in their various ways to sort of capture it, to organize it, to lead it, um, to profit off of it or otherwise extinguish its fire. Um, instead, and as has so often been the case in American history, it was poor black youth joined and amplified by many of the other people who are dominated by the white supremacist systems of police, prisons, and poverty, who have once again opened up the question of reconstruction, of abolition, and of revolution. I want to stress that I join my thought to those who have risen up this year, this decade, and in years past against the system that it is with and through those people that I always aspire to think, learn, and move. I take the admonition from Sylvia Winter to heart that we think and study alongside those black and impoverished and otherwise dehumanized and socially exiled people, as it is precisely they who are busy creating a new ethics of liberation. I owe my understanding of movement history in the US to W.E.B. Du Bois, to Dia Hartman, and many, many others who have demonstrated the myriad ways Black people in this country have fought, experimented, organized, and transformed their lives and society in the face of a system that would refuse them all freedoms. I follow an anarchistic or perhaps simply revolutionary tradition that believes that those who fight for their freedom are the ones who have the most to teach us about what that freedom should and can look like, who understand both the stakes of the struggle and the scope of the fight, and that all revolutionary theory must begin with the simple act of taking those people and their actions seriously, um, which I'll try to do here uh, as much as I can. So it's a crucial moment uh, to talk about movement tactics of which nonviolence is, uh, is perhaps the most famous. Um, despite the depths of winter, we are in a period of heightened and intense struggle. Here in Philadelphia in October, um, we had a few days of rioting and uprising after the police murder of Walter Wallace Jr. Pictured it here. Um, it was similar in scope to the uprising for Freddie Gray in Baltimore in 2015, but the Philadelphia struggle was forgotten almost as quickly as it began outside of Philly. Um, partially that's because it was just before the elections, but it's also, um, it's also because we've entered a period in which intense urban uprisings against the police have become so commonplace as to become almost unmemorable nationally. Um, the last time that was the case was the 60s um, when they're very common. Um, that's a problem that they're unmemorable, that we're forgetting them. Um, it's important that we amplify and remember each reverberation in the social fabric until we fully, fully tear it asunder. But it also indicates that the usual ideological repressive mechanisms are not working anymore to keep us from fighting back. That uprising is becoming more common and more attractive. And we can see uh, those ideological mechanisms uh, shifting in real time as the state, the media, corporations and activists scramble to put the genie back in the bottle, uh, the genie of abolition, the genie of revolution. And one of the key methods of control and anti-movement repression over the last six decades has actually been the idea of nonviolence. I say the idea of nonviolence uh, purposefully because nonviolence as we are taught to believe in it never really existed. 
In the United States, it was a tactical experiment in the 50s and 60s that was raised into a principle, a philosophy, and a dogma uh, when it proved a valuable movement management tool to the state and various social forces that wanted the appearance of change without fundamental transformation. Um, Nonviolence is very good at that. Uh, that history, as we will get to later, of both of the emergence of the ideology and of its use, incredibly useful uh, nature as a tactic in the 60s and 50s, um, was complicated and contingent. But the nonviolent dogma that emerged uh, is very, very simple. Um, a movement that is good, that is focused, that is disciplined, that is organized, and most importantly, that is successful, will be nonviolent. Anything that is not nonviolent is morally bad, unconvincing, ineffective, and playing into the hands of the state and reactionaries. Um, and a note on terminology here, I use the rather clunky phrase, not nonviolent, purposefully, um, though there are many more forms of violence than just literal physical blows to a human body. I don't believe a de definition of the word violence that encompasses uh, burning a dumpster's content in the middle of the street, but also the police lynching of George Floyd is remotely helpful. Um, calling actions like breaking a window violent uh, places the whole argument within the rhetorical structure of nonviolence ideology. So in that case, not nonviolent, this very awkward phrase that you're going to hear me say over and over again, not nonviolent becomes the more uh, useful term precisely for its sort of alienating effect here. So um, the 2020 uprisings were so widespread, so powerful, and so popular at one point, a poll revealed that 54% of Americans believed that burning down the third police precinct in Minneapolis was justified, that the usual disavowal of all violence and all rioting, which comes during these movements, um, gave way to a more nuanced dismissal. For folks who remember and were active during Black Lives Matter wave in Ferguson and Baltimore and Charlotte in 2014 and 2015, looting and rioting were disavowed completely by the commentariat, um, very few voices, even within the movement, were arguing that rioters' actions made sense and were good. Um, it, was, it, was, it was very common that people were saying, I support the movement, but I don't support the rioting. I don't support the looting, right? I think we've all heard that. Um, in the George Floyd uprisings, uh, the dialogue shifted, at least for a few months. Um, and even outside sympathetic observers who maybe weren't you know, participating began distinguishing between like looting big box stores like Target, or attacking police cars, and between looting, burning small businesses, or attacking sort of like Confederate statues, people said, okay, I understand why you tear down a Confederate statue, but Columbus was a harder argument, right? This is a big shift. It wasn't just all property destruction is bad, all looting is bad. It was, okay, some of it is good, some of it I understand, some of it is bad. That's a big, big change. Um, and But I think it's also very telling, because we see in it that the idea of pure nonviolence um, gives way to what is actually its root content, which is a defense of the law and private property. People are much, much more comfortable defending uh, the law and private property in its less ecocidal and less corporate forms um, in the romanticized small business. And we saw this a lot this summer. People really are very upset if you, if you say, I'm not, I don't have a problem with looting small businesses. Um, a more full-throated, Nonviolent, purely pacifist argument of the kind that 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 was more common in 2014 and 2015 took a few months to um, to emerge. It, it waited for the movement to sort of decline before we started to see it. But in September, um, a crisis mapping nonprofit called ACLED, oh, excuse me, ACLED, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, um, which tracks quote unquote non uh, political violence released a report that said that 93% of Black Lives Matter demonstrations were peaceful. Um, this report was shared super widely on social media by activists. It was covered in CNN. All the big news networks covered it. It was this big, big deal. They're like, look, like the majority of these movements were, were the majority of this movement was nonviolent, was peaceful. Um, it's as though that the fact that we participated in months of nonviolent marching only after there had been weeks of really like almost insurrectionary street fighting that somehow the nonviolent actions that came after and that were the majority were the most relevant, the most important aspect of the movement. They revealed the real nature of the uprising um, as opposed to the first two weeks that started the movement of rioting. Um, this is actually uh, well within the line, um, well within the methods of uh, the nonviolent and civil resistance uh, theorists um, there's a big movement of academics, social scientists, think tanks, nonprofits, 
um, and they release books and studies. Here's here's a few of them for you. Um, they release they release uh, studies and books, and they give talks, um, arguing that not only were particular social movements successful because they were nonviolent, um, but that nonviolent civil disobedience is actually the only effective and the only legitimate mode of popular revolt or revolution. Um, if a claim this large, uh, it's the only successful mode were true, or even mostly true, uh, there would be a lot of examples, right? It'd be very, very easy to say, here are all these examples. Um, but when we look more carefully at the examples that these people have chosen, um, we can see that despite them cherry picking events, uh, movements, often their arguments about nonviolence uh, still hide the historical context and facts of the movements they choose to describe. Um, so I'm going to get into some of this a bit um, about one of one of the, the books here, Why Civil Resistance Works. You can see it on the screen. Um, it's by Erica Chenoweth. Um, they are a uh, uh, one of the more important leaders in this sort of thought about nonviolence um, and social movement. Um, the book was released in 2011. Um, the study and the book was co-written with Maria, uh, Maria Stefan, um, who is who works at the State Department. Um, uh, and it argues that nonviolent movements have been twice as effective as violent ones, um, and that it's been a really touchstone for, for all of these sort of proponents of nonviolence. Um, Why Civil Resistance Works uses the Serbian Otpor movement um, and the 2000 revolution that overthrew Slobodan Milosevic as a central example of nonviolent victory. Um, here's, some, here's some images of that in 2000 and then Otpor. As activist uh, and historian Lorenzo Raymond has pointed out, um, Otpor is used despite the fact that the movement came and toppled Milosevic um, after he had lost a war with NATO, um, that the movement was in fact running alongside a armed insurgency um, called the UCPMB that was that made the same demands as the movement and was operating at the same time, not decidedly not nonviolently. Um, and that uh, Milosevic, despite this movement, didn't resign uh, until there had been rioting after he refused to uh, accept election results in 2000. So this not nonviolent victory escalated into rioting when the people in power refused the movement's demands. Um, in their 2016 book, This is an Uprising, nonviolence champions and brothers Mark and Paul Engel, Englers refer to this as things, quote unquote, getting a little out of hand. Um, Peter Ackerman, who was a venture capitalist who uh, supported a lot of Gene Sharp's work. Gene Sharp's another really famous voice in this, in this debate. Um, uh, Peter Ackerman argued, once claimed that Ukraine's Euromaidan movement should be considered nonviolent because, quote, only a minority of the protesters threw firebombs and brandished guns. Um, in 2011, we also saw many nonviolence practitioners claiming Egypt as a nonviolent uh, victory despite the fact that in the 2011 Egyptian revolution, more than a dozen police officers were killed and police stations all over the country were burnt to the ground. So um, as Lorenzo Raymond writes, and I quote, a good faith argument for pacifist success in such cases would credit the intervening factors as a diversity of tactics supporting a nonviolent core or attribute it to what is known in social movement theory as the radical flank effect. Excuse me one second. Um, which argues that the presence of radical militants in a social movement helps make the less militant actors seem reasonable and worthy of having their demands met. And this is a very common argument, you know, about a diversity of tactics. Okay, if most people are nonviolent and you have some violent people, well, that works out well because the government wants to negotiate with the nonviolent people. Um, but instead, folks like uh, Chenoweth, Anglers, uh, Sharp, and many others directly attack and disavow militants and militant movements of all kinds. Um, so, one of their big arguments is that militancy plays into the hands of the state and brings repression that crushes the movement. Um, and here we actually uncover one of the core features of sort of movement nonviolence as an ideology, which is that it naturalizes and justifies state repression, treating it as an unavoidable and unchangeable fact. This may seem contradictory at first. Um, nonviolence advocates, obviously, often point out that state repression and brutality faced by activists is absolutely unjustifiable. And I agree 100%, it is unjustifiable. Um, indeed, the moral core of nonviolence as a tactic is in its ability to demonstrate the arbitrary violence and repression of the state uh, 
in the face of even a mild challenge to traffic laws or any other sort of such disruption of the urban space, you know, we see that police react incredibly violently. Um, so nonviolence is based precisely on its capacity to provoke and induce repression, right? We fill the jails, we take arrests, we share images of police violence and intimidation. The strategy of nonviolence involves breaking laws in order to demonstrate the injustice of those laws and their maintenance, or at least to cause enough disruption to capture popular attention. And yet, they also argue that anyone who pursues a not nonviolent course of action, um, as pictured here, for example, physically defending themselves against police and white supremacists, um, refusing to allow themselves to be arrested, um, fighting back against police lines, building barricades, um, they argue that these people deserve the repression which they bring down on themselves. The, the argument is any movement that violates strict nonviolence is unsafe to its participants. How many times have you heard, you know, someone sort of say, stop doing that. That's, you know, that's not safe. You're making us, you know, you're breaking the law. It's, it's, it's dangerous to be doing that in a march. Um, this is a pretty common thing to hear from nonviolence activists on the street. Um, and therefore, Anyone who violates strict nonviolence must be held responsible for the state's actions, unlike the nonviolent protesters of whom repression is an outrage, right? So people are told not to escalate. They're told that nonviolence will prevent the police from being excessively, excessively violent toward activists. This reflects a shoddy analysis of state violence in the face of the very thing that these uprisings have been about. Uh, black people being killed for walking in the middle of the street, for selling CDs or cigarettes, for driving with a broken taillight, for wearing a hoodie, and, and, and on and on and on. Um, how is it that we can go to the streets to protest that violence, still believing that our behavior dictates police response, rather than recognizing that the police will brutalize whoever they want, whenever they want to, unless we can stop them? In fact, most not nonviolent tactics, which can include such disparate things as covering your face, dressing in a block, uh, doing graffiti, de-arresting people, building barricades, but also attacking police lines with projectile, uh, projectiles and destroying police vehicles, all of these tactics are designed to reduce repression directly by making it harder for police to arrest us while we go about fighting for a better world. Nonviolence tactics, with their emphasis on trainings, discipline, and playing according to a plan, give their activists a sense of control of the situation. A sense of control that is, in my opinion, false. Uh, it's belied by the fact that the men with guns and handcuffs ultimately end up controlling the situation. If we are indeed helpless in the face of police control on the state, and if we accept this state of affairs to the point of more or less consenting to it, then the nonviolent activists logic goes, that's a bit of a tongue twister, until such time as the people who do actually control the police. And here that means a particular politician, a law or a policy, or it might mean something like the people, the community, the voters. Until those people can step in to fulfill the activists demands, then, then uh, there's no change can be made. What not nonviolent tactics recognize is that actually, we can strip control and power of the situation from the police and the state directly, at least temporarily on the street, if we fight together in order to imagine and start to create a different and better world. So uh, what is the problem that pacifist activists have with these not nonviolent actions then? I would argue that it's not that they're violent. Um, personally, I don't think building barricades, painting on walls, breaking things, hiding your identity, or lighting trash on fire. Um, I don't think those things are violent in and of themselves. Um, what they are, however, is unrepentantly illegal and criminal. They're disrespectful of property rights and they are out of control. The nonviolence advocates breaks the law in order to be arrested, right? They, they break the law as a demonstration. They demonstrate their dissatisfaction with the state of things, but ultimately they allow themselves to be arrested. They comply with the justice of the system and its police forces. Nonviolent activism is based on appealing to a fundamental justice of the lawmakers and the law, perhaps the constitution, perhaps the parliament or the Supreme Court, or maybe the electorate, the people, which will change the leadership as necessary. In any case, nonviolent activism depends on and appeals to a fundamental goodness in liberal democracy. It imagines that as citizens, 
we have the ability to petition the people in power safely and easily, and that um, therefore there is an ultimate goodness, an ultimate justice in the powers that be, and they need simply be reminded of their originary purpose. They need to be educated about an injustice that's happening in society, or maybe at the most dramatic, we need the managers and the leaders currently in charge of the system to be replaced. We need a new president, we need a new judge, we need a new senator, whatever. Um, so rather than a modern and up-to-date conception of revolt, which I think it often claims, um, I believe this actually echoes back to a strategic philosophy of um, feudal peasant movements. <laughs> um, we have some nice illustrations here. Um, these, these peasant movements believed that the local magistrates, lords, and tax collectors were corrupt and were greedy, that the peasants revolted in order to get the attention of and deliver a petition to the king, the God-chosen king. Um, the king or the sovereign was at least partially divine. And as soon as they learned of the plight of the poor peasants, they would intervene. Um, you know, the king would come and intervene, but because he was so distantly separated, the, legend, the, the logic went of the peasant movements um, that he had to be informed by revolt. Um, of course, uh, as you can see in these pictures, um, the peasants usually rose up in uh, what were referred to as jacqueries in these wild, wild uprisings that involved setting fire to the countryside, murdering vassals and road agents and tax collectors, um, you know, throwing down, storming the castle walls. But, you know, the, the more things change, the more things stay the same, right? Um, Nonviolent activists today, uh, through their controlled and limited disobedience, appeal to those in power with a display of meta-obedience to the foundational state and the democratic social contract. Much like the peasants appeal to demonstrate a meta-obedience to the sovereign by rejecting a corrupt lord, so do nonviolent practitioners appeal to the goodness of the sovereign, in this case, the liberal democratic state, by rejecting a certain law or a certain politician, et cetera. Um, and yet, nonviolent practitioners have the gall to accuse the not nonviolent rioter of being a tool of the state, of being exactly what the police want to see. Um, and we saw some of that, uh, what I would say is projection <laughs> uh, throughout the summer. Um, if you remember, uh, people were claim claimed that the prevalence of fireworks in urban centers was a CIA op uh, to cause disruption to cities and revolts. Um, the police were perfect, purposely hiding and placing piles of bricks and construction material throughout cities during riots, um, or that the riots in their entirety had been started by white supremacists. That, was, that, that became very common. There has been no evidence backing up any of this, but the last claim was so effective as a counterinsurgent myth that the police directly played into it. Um, in one example, in September, uh, Minneapolis police uh, created national headlines when a press release announcing a warrant for a white supremacist biker who they accused with footage had started the riots in uh, Minneapolis, the George Floyd uprisings with an act of arson. As far as I can tell now, six months out, there has been no follow-up, no updates, ev evidence and trial haven't been presented to the public, but it doesn't matter, that's not the point. The point is that the headline traveled, that word got out that the riots were started by racists. After rioters destroyed a Wendy's in Atlanta, um, where Rayshard Brooks was murdered by the police for the crime of sleeping in his car in the Wendy's parking lot, if you remember that happened in June. Um, online activists uh, who claimed that real protesters and mourners would never actually be violent, argued that the riot at Wendy's was started by a white supremacist infiltrator. Um, they combed through hours of video footage of the event and they eventually discovered and highlighted a white woman helping to ignite the Wendy's claiming she was, uh, she was police or she was a deep state operative or she was alt-right or something, but clearly she was suspicious. In fact, it turned out that she was Rayshard Brooks's partner who was fighting back in grief and agony after her partner had been unjustly murdered by the police. Um, we found out she was his partner because the police used the online sleuthing to find her, identify her and arrest her. She now faces decades in prison. I hope that the similarity between the methods and the mode of thinking behind this anti-riot paranoia on the left and the conspiracy theories of the far right are clear. The attempts to attach criminality, anti-police and anti-property action to supreme whiteness 
would be hilarious if it weren't so deadly serious. As Sadia Hartman has argued, um, and many others as well, historically, Black people in America have only and exclusively had access to subjecthood through legal discipline and punishment, e.g. as criminals. Emancipation at the end of the Civil War um, often meant the transformation of slave to criminal and overseer to police officer. Um, this she refers to as the, the tragic continuity of whiteness and blackness over the event called emancipation. Whiteness, meanwhile, is after all the er property from which all other property flows, the concept uh, through which and in which the police, the law, and property find their justification. Unfortunately, it's just an hour talk. I can't get into that entire argument. You can read about it in my book. You can read about it in Sadia Hartman's Scenes of Subjection. There's a very good essay by legal scholar Cheryl Harris called Whiteness as Property. It's also in Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, Noel Ignatieff's How the Irish Became White, and many other places besides. In any case, the idea that the state or white supremacists prefer a massive Black-led anti-police uprising to its absence is not one I think many people would accept when it's stated like that. I don't think you would say, that, oh, the police prefer riots to their absence. It's, it's, it, I think it sounds absurd. But that is what ends up happening. That becomes the logical conclusion of arguments about white supremacists starting the riots, about the police you know, uh, instigating more violence. Um, that, that's that logic. The myth of nonviolence is so powerful and pervasive the idea that nonviolence is good and resistant and violence, not nonviolence is bad and what the police want, it's so pervasive that people will use any justification to explain to themselves why rioters, why street fighters, and why poor black people taking freedom into their own hands are not in fact part of the movement, are not politically aware, are not on the right side of history, don't know what they're doing. They're dupes, they're sheep, they're playing into the hands of the state. Uh, to the point where literally everything turns upside down, where whiteness becomes criminal and where, where crime becomes white supremacist. In fact, people who say this is exactly what the right want in the face of riots um, and uprisings often just reveal, uh, to me anyway, they reveal that when they see images of disorder and revolt, they suddenly agree with the right and they want the right to come and repress it. They do nothing except tell on themselves. Um, this reached, some of this logic reached its apotheosis uh, in the white riot at the Capitol on January 6th, which saw commentators refer to the rioters, as you can see here, um, who have overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly turned out to be middle class business owners, professionals, uh, military and state personnel, and police. Um, they referred to them as anarchists, as insurrectionists. Um, it is important to recognize that rioting is a tactic one that can and often has been used by forces of repression, violence, and discrimination. Indeed, white rioting was a central Jim Crow tactic in the early 20th century. The argument I am making is not that anyone rioting is on the, on the side of justice, but the way the Capitol riot was covered implied that what was outrageous, what was outrageous and offensive about the attempted coup was that they dared to storm the Capitol building at all, not that they were, say, a white supremacist mob attempting to institute a fascist coup on behalf of an anti-Semitic and queer phobic conspiracy theory in which the racist game show host billionaire son of a slumlord president was a combination of Christ Rambo and Charles Bronson who would soon use martial law to send all their enemies to concentration camps, thereby protecting the country and the world from a secret ring of pedophile Democrats, which is what they believed. That, that's kind of what was outrageous, not that they uh, went into the Capitol building illegally. And this is another major problem with nonviolence. Nonviolence asks the wrong questions. Nonviolence places the entire moral and political weight of a social movement, not on what and who it fights for, but on how they do so. It is a bad framing of the problem and a trap. Um, I think here, when we think of how anti-abortion activists defined themselves as pro-life, they made sure that the entire abortion debate happened on their terrain, because of course, who could be against life? So too does the idea of nonviolence poison the well, implying that you can either be on the side of nonviolence or you can be a bloodthirsty violence promoter and a nihilistic believer in the ends justify the means. 
Um, in an interview about my book, Isaac Chotner uh, at The New Yorker genuinely seems to believe and tried to get me to admit that my argument boiled down to, to make an omelet, you gotta break a few eggs. I don't believe that. Um, that's just as vague and unhelpful as I think most of the concepts of nonviolence. Accusing advocates of diversity of tactics, of being comfortable with anything, um, is another projection, another projection uh, that nonviolence ad advocates participate in. Um, a belief in nonviolence, a belief in nonviolence, in fact, does not necessarily line up with any other anti-oppression or ethical standards that we might recognize. Someone's relationship to nonviolence or pacifism actually tells us very little about their other political commitments. Um, and for proof of that, I'm going to point to history's most famous advocate of nonviolence, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi, the racist misogynist founder of modern nonviolent philosophy, most fundamentally reflects the authoritarian character that nonviolence can take as a movement logic particularly as it rests on a rather hazy definition of violence that gives a leader the capacity to define what is or isn't violent. Excuse me. On two separate occasions, Gandhi called off strikes by his followers by calling them violent, which forced the movement into months of introspection of self-critique and reorganization um, because friends of his owned the factories that were being struck against. His anti-Blackness is now widely known. Uh, as an advocate for Indians in South Africa, he continually expressed his hatred and his disdain for Black Africans, worrying that European colonizers were degrading Indians to their level. He also believed menstruation was a sign of corruption. He campaigned against contraception. He believed that fathers were right to honor kill their daughters who had been assaulted. And he made young female followers sleep naked in bed with him to prove his purity. None of these things apparently contradict nonviolent philosophy. Now, the point is not simply guilt by association uh, to tear down a founder and thereby the whole movement he inspired. Obviously that's not how ideas work. Um, it is absolutely possible that someone could have one good idea and a bunch of other really bad ones. Um, but I do think it's telling that someone who could devote their whole lives to nonviolent practice and theorization could remain unrepentantly misogynist, anti-Black, and pro-caste. Um, in other words, as a philosophy and ethic in its most famous exemplar, it did not produce a liberatory worldview. Um, and this, is, this, this I match with the other leader famous for his devotion to nonviolence, um, Martin Luther King Jr who died ambivalent about the possibilities of the philosophy and frustrated by its limitations. And here, um, and this is the, the, the heart of the, the argument, we have to grapple with the civil rights movement, that most famous American legacy of nonviolence and the core historical events on which nonviolent dogma in the United States is based. It is an appealingly simple historical narrative that there was a successful nonviolent civil rights movement in the South in the 50s and early 60s which in the late 60s gave way to a misguided, violent Northern black power aftermath. This mythical narrative shapes not only our understanding of that period, but also our perspectives on modern social movement activity in America. Though this myth is based on selective historical truths, the broader narrative is entirely false. While it is true that nonviolence proved itself effective in desegregating certain public facilities throughout the 50s and 60s, Away from the cameras, demonstrators and organizers armed themselves. Idealistic, nonviolence trained freedom riders were guarded where they worked, lived, and slept by local people with guns, sometimes over their objections. The very image of disciplined philosophical nonviolence, Martin Luther King, traveled with a heavily armed entourage. His home was protected by armed guards, and one visitor described the inside as an arsenal. This is not to call out his hypocrisy, but to point out that it was a necessary fact of organizing in the Jim Crow South. Guns were a crucial part of the freedom movement. And what exactly was that movement? The way we learned about it in school, or at least the way I did, was that it's the series of struggles that achieved mass recognition. It was the Montgomery bus boycott, Little Rock, the student sit-ins, the freedom rides, Birmingham, the March on Washington, Mississippi Freedom uh, Summer, Selma, you know, all, all, these, all these big events that got national uh, notoriety. I think it's better understood 
as the culmination of hundreds of local struggles against white supremacy. Struggles large and small across the entire country, north and south, east and west, unfolding across decades um, from within World War II up until the end of Jim Crow and the 70s. Um, these local movements shared some infrastructure, they shared some ideology, and they shared some tactics, but they had very different goal histories, strategies, goals, and results, and they all had different relationships to nonviolence. In other words, there is an increasingly large body of academic and activist work demonstrating that there never was a simple, straightforward, unified, nonviolent civil rights movement. Here are some of the books um, that, are, that are coming out recently about this. The majority of those who worked within the nonviolent tradition treated nonviolence as an effective tactic, not as a moral philosophy. Um, furthermore, to the degree that nonviolence was an effective tactic, and it was, it was so only because of a historical combination of national and international dynamics, chiefly Northern disdain for Southern backwardness and Cold War competition for influence over newly formed post-colonial governments in the global South. If you'll remember in the 50s, um, much of Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America were throwing off um, European colonizers. Um, and these, suddenly these new independent nations were choosing whether to ally with the USSR, eventually China, or the US. Um, all of these factors allowed Northern liberals to side with Southern black activists um, to force the federal government to care about its moral image in the, war, in the world, not in the war. And still, even under those circumstances, even with all of those caveats, Nonviolent campaigners were often protected by force of arms, and many campaigns devolved into decidedly not nonviolent rioting and direct action. Again, this is not to slander the legacy, incredibly important and valuable legacy of those who operated within strict nonviolence, but to point out that many of them operated with nonviolence one day and then went on to participate in street fighting or not nonviolent armed struggle later and that we cannot simply divide these people, these movements so cleanly. Um, but in order to see the false construction of this broader narrative, it's really important to focus in on the truths upon which it's based, okay? And here's the, these are the successes of nonviolence and they're very real. Um, on February 1st, 1960, four students from North Carolina a and University sat down at a whites only lunch counter in Greensboro, Woolworth, where they were refused service. They stayed until closing. The next day, 20 students showed up. The following day, 60. Within a few weeks, sit-ins had spread all across North Carolina and to Tennessee, to Kentucky, and to Virginia. By the spring, almost every city in the South was experiencing nonviolent sit-in movements in all their downtowns. Dozens of lunch counters, hotels, and restaurants were desegregated through this method, although some weathered the storm and remained whites only. Images of students being beaten, spat upon, and arrested for the crime of sitting on a stool spread nationwide and did exactly what nonviolence tactics are meant to do. It galvanized anger, support, resistance, and, and pity. It was an important and it was a radicalizing moment. Nonviolent <coughs> tactics again proved effective in the next massive campaign in the South, in the Freedom Rides of 1961, in which CORE and the SNCC organized white and black activists to ride together on buses into the Deep South to test desegregation laws and rulings on interstate travel. The Freedom Rise traveled through the Upper South in relative peace, but in Alabama and Mississippi, they faced terrible, terrible violence with a few activists beaten nearly to death. Massive mobs met buses at stations, segregations even lit, segregationists even lit one bus on fire while Freedom Riders were still on board. The violence shocked the country and the rides, which lasted throughout the summer, eventually forced President Kennedy to end bus segregation. The Freedom Rides were incredibly inspiring events. They put the whole country on notice of the seriousness of the movement. Ironically, however, the Freedom Rides, which cemented nonviolence as the definitive tactic of the freedom of the civil rights movement, were also the last major success of that tactic. As struggles blossomed all over the South, the philosophy of nonviolence met the reality of black life under Jim Crow and the truth of Knight Riders, the KKK and fascist police. Many black people in the rural South were already armed as a result of subsistence hunting because of a history of effective black self-defense. Um, and here there's a quote from Ida B. Wells. This was, this was very common in the 1910s, the 1920s. Um, uh, and, a, and as well as a generalized Southern gun culture. 
Um, many of the Northern activists and workers who came South acquired guns as well. Even the Freedom Riders, the most devoted Freedom Riders, uh, had been protected while they stayed with Black supporters overnight by armed guards, guards armed guards. Um, as Professor and SNCC member Charles Cobb um, wrote in his incredibly important book, This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, willingness to engage in armed self-defense played an important role in the Southern Freedom Movement, for without it, terrorists would have killed far more people in the movement. Um, rather than the stark distinction that uh, was polemically laid out by Malcolm X, that it was either the ballot or the bullet, uh, Kwa uh, historian Kwame Jeffries has written that for the most for most of the activists in the Black Freedom Movement, the relationship between ballots and bullets was both and. Now, the advocates of nonviolence were aware of this dynamic, obviously. Um, and here again, I'm going to quote Charles Cobb. For most activists, nonviolence was simply a useful tactic, one that did not preclude self-defense whenever it was considered necessary and possible. Even King acknowledged the legitimacy of self-defense and sometimes blurred the line between nonviolence and self-defense. It wasn't just Martin Luther King. As Lance Hill has written, James Lawson, the movement's foremost spokesman for Gandhian nonviolence, admitted later, and this is a direct quote of, of, of uh, James Lawson, that there never had been an acceptance of the nonviolence approach in the South, and the idea that Black people had initially accepted nonviolence and then became disillusioned was nonsense. Okay, so this is this is James Lawson, literally the core nonviolent organizer of the movement. Okay, so if all of the movement was driven by these partially not nonviolent methods, and so many of the activists literally had their lives saved by force of arms, why did they so widely and consistently spread the myth of their own nonviolence? It, it, it has to be asked. Um, and I think one, one way that we can look at it is by looking at the history of the Birmingham, Alabama movement in 1963, which helps show the combination of tactical contingency and movement media portrayals that helped build the nonviolence myth. Um, the struggle in Birmingham, Alabama led eventually to the creation of the first civil rights act. The Birmingham desegregation fight in 1963 shook the world with televised images of black children being blasted with fire hoses and attacked by public safety commissioner Eugene Bull Connors police dogs. Um, these images brought uh, Martin Luther King and the SCLC, uh, who had been the leaders of the Birmingham struggle, back into the national spotlight after a disastrous previous campaign. So after the Freedom Rides of 61, um, King went down to Albany, Georgia, a small city um, where he and fellow activists had been completely defeated in their nonviolent approach. And they were defeated by a very clever chief of police, this guy, Lori Pritchett. Um, so Lori Pritchett studied nonviolent tactics and he took advantage of them. He disciplined his officers incredibly well and trained them to never, ever use force against nonviolent protesters. He also uh, made a network of local and county jails all around, uh, around Albany um, so that they never could fill the jails up, which was the, the, the core tactic. Um, filling the jails, which creates logistical crises for the police and creates media spectacles, it didn't happen. Pritchett successfully organized the police such that these, these, these pieces of leverage completely failed. And the Albany movement, which had a very, very large activist base, it almost fully mobilized the community in a way that very few movements of the period could. Um, it, it ended in bitter defeat. Albany remained segregated. In Birmingham, um, the campaign started similarly, but it faced a much less peaceful and disciplined police force, um, and itself was less insistent on nonviolence. Uh, King had much, much less control of Birmingham than he did of Albany, um, and his lack of top-down control was actually to the movement's benefit. Uh, Lorenzo Raymond writes, King wasn't able to get consistent media coverage until, af until after protests became a duel of rocks and fire hoses. One of King's aides, Vincent Harding, later acknowledged that the black youth who came to dominate the campaign street action were the children of Malcolm X, and they escalated to a burning, car smashing, police battling response. Indeed, the Birmingham, Alabama struggle, seen as a nonviolent victory, should more properly be seen as the first of the urban riots of the period. Rioters took over and held the downtown for days. They smashed storefronts, they looted, and they successfully beat back police. This rioting not only defined the campaign, 
but also proved crucial to its historical effects. It was the riot and fear of it spreading to other cities, combined with international relations problems that were caused by the images of police violence um, that panicked uh, at that point Secretary of State Bobby Kennedy um, and forced him into giving and forced uh, JFK into giving his famous speech calling for civil rights legislation, which would eventually lead to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The rioting, I wanna be clear again, the rioting wouldn't have happened without the organizing, without the marches and without the rallies, but that effort, that nonviolent effort wouldn't have worked without the rioting as we saw only months earlier in Albany, Georgia. But in the wake of Birmingham, national civil rights leaders downplayed the violence. The official text of the, moment of the movement became Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, you've likely read it, um, while the images that broke through the national consciousness are dogs snapping and fire hoses blasting, um, images of black victimization, not images of those children getting up and throwing rocks at the police. And in fact, they're much harder to find, although they do exist. MLK distanced himself from rioters in order to promote a narrative of a unified nonviolent philosophy and immediately pivoted towards organizing the March on Washington. Um, Nonviolence gave the early civil rights movement the legitimacy it required to receive support from Northern liberals. Um, we can see here on the right, the March from Washington meeting with the president um, who, uh, who agreed to the meeting as long as they agreed to keep the march nonviolent. Money from liberals kept organizers in the field and white media coverage gave national attention on the struggle. Nonviolence gave black people moral room to maneuver in a country that always a priori viewed them as criminal and amoral. This is no small achievement. And it won widespread sympathy and demonstrated that the violence of police and Southern white people was unprovoked and was thus inherent to their power. But nonviolence suffered from strategic weaknesses too. Namely, it overestimated the power of the white liberal. The strategy of nonviolence hinged on Southern rate, uh, excuse me. The strategy of nonviolence hinged on Southern racists producing sympathy among liberals and thus leading those liberals to fight for structural change in state and federal governments. But ironically, Dr. King's experience of the Northern liberal, his personal experience, eventually pushed him away from his previous nonviolent convictions. In 1965, Martin Luther King and his, organize, his organization, the SLCC, began a fair housing campaign in Chicago. Um, but, and you can see some images here from Chicago. Um, while they were there, they found that while economic and housing discrimination in the North created much the same conditions, nonviolent marches were actually much less effective. When MLK marched in Chicago and famously in, in the uh, reactionary suburb of Cicero, unlike in small Southern towns, uh, thousands and thousands of white supremacists could come out and do a counter protest. This was, needless to say, an incredibly threatening and disempowering experience. And in the meantime, Mayor Richard Daley uh, demonstrated the anti-movement efficacy of no Northern Democratic politicians. Um, he appeared publicly to be negotiating, to be accepting the movement demands, while actually behind closed doors, he was stonewalling on all but the most basic and minor concessions. As a result of these experiences, Martin Luther King grew increasingly radical and pessimistic about reform. He began believing that black people were integrating into a burning house, as his famous quote goes and that a more fundamental socialist transformation of society was required. By 1967, he was arguing for radical fundamental change because, and I quote, only by structural change can current evils be eliminated because the roots are in the system rather than in man or faulty operations. As he would put it in a speech in 1967, quote, it didn't cost a penny to deal with lunch counters and integrate lunch counters. It didn't cost the nation one penny to guarantee the right to vote. It is much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to eradicate slums. So Dr. King, uh, his experience is typical of many of those in the civil rights struggle who stayed with it for decades. And again, unlike the, unlike the Gandhi slander from earlier, I believe that MLK was, was genuinely committed to liberation um, and in the process of, of that commitment, learned and grew away from nonviolence um, and in doing so, he mirrored much of the experience of other folks in the movement. Um, as a result, however, of our talking about nonviolence today, we have again talked about Martin Luther King and gone over the same stories of civil rights struggle you've probably heard. As a result, we haven't talked about Gloria Richardson, 
um, and the Cambridge, Maryland movement that actively and openly rejected both nonviolence and elections, instead fighting in a series of riotous ballot battles with police and the National Guard in 1962 and 1963, which won major concessions. Um, Richardson was on the cover of national newspapers and magazines for, ye for, for years, um, but now is almost completely forgotten, partially because she got snubbed at the March on Washington and wasn't even invited, despite being probably the most famous uh, female leader in the movement other than Rosa Parks. Um, we haven't talked about Monroe, North Carolina, and its early evocation of armed self-defense, uh, Monroe leader and militant activist Robert F. Williams, who would have to flee the United States and exile to Cuba for advocating armed revolution, not in the late 60s, but in 1963. We haven't gone in depth into the work of the Reverend Albert Kliege in Detroit and his strategy of chaos, nor the small but highly influential RAM, a proto-Black Panther, Black Power Marxist organization that operated in the early 60s. And we certainly haven't begun to discuss the 750 urban revolts that brought the United States to the brink of revolution from 1964 to 1968. Now, obviously, I wrote this talk, so it's my fault we haven't talked about those things. But I want to say the myth of nonviolence has so restricted, edited, and censored our understanding of the movement that we don't even realize we know almost nothing about it. I certainly didn't until I really started researching the era for my book and realized, despite how much I'd already read and seen documentaries and thought about the era, just how little I actually knew. This historical mythologizing of the civil rights struggle is often mirrored in the retelling, <clears throat> excuse me, in the retelling of the peace movement and the fight against the war in Vietnam. As it has been famously narrativized by Todd Gitlin um, and many others, the anti-Vietnam War movement was also split and ruined by not nonviolent militancy. At first, it flourished as a nonviolent student anti-draft movement that involved hippies putting flowers in the barrels of soldiers' guns and burning draft cards and mass marches. Then, around 1968, after militants, new leftists, and radicals rioted at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, as the story goes, they gave the 68 election to Nixon, the movement splintered, it lost popularity, and everything went downhill. Um, in this narrative, this bad part of the movement, this bad not nonviolent, uh, gave birth to the armed struggle groups, most famously the Weather Underground, uh, but they were just one of many lefty terrorist groups, uh, left terrorist groups in the United States. This is another fact that we don't know. The late 60s uh, in the US was a period of massive left-wing terrorism. Between January 1969 and spring of 1970 alone, there were 4,330 terrorist bombings in the United States. Um, as the nonviolent narrative goes, it was the fault of these militants that the movement stalled out. It was the fault of these militants that the movement lost popular support and failed to end the war as soon as it could have. There are two massive gaps in this argument and a bunch of smaller gaps. We're gonna talk about the two big ones. Um, the first is it reproduces the absolute white narcissism of the student peace movement. A narcissism that the armed struggle groups in their way were trying to overcome. Because by 1965, when the draft coward burnings were only just beginning and the nonviolent student movement against the war was just beginning, the massive Watts rebellion in LA, which was famous as a race and civil rights riot, was already also about the Vietnam War. The draft in America disproportionately affected black men. Um, in fact, a quick glance at the numbers and someone could do a, a more in-depth study of this. It appears that the same, it is the same disproportionate effect that the draft had on black men during Vietnam as it does now during our period of mass incarceration. Um, so many of the men who participated in, uh, in the Watts riot in 65 or the Philadelphia riot in 64 or the ones in upstate New York or in uh, Brooklyn in 65, they were of draft age. Um, one rioter was quoted uh, who told uh, SNCC newspaper, the movement, this is a movement newspaper, quote, I'd rather die here than in Vietnam, unquote, about rioting in Watts. This analysis was widely reproduced by civil rights movement newspapers and activists. It was available. It was in the zeitgeist. The anti-war movement easily could have seen this information if they had wanted to look. The predominantly white, middle-class, university-based anti-war movement, driven by theories of nonviolence and pacifist resistance, 
failed to see the crucial anti-Vietnam dimension of the riots and therefore failed to form unity with rioters, which it might have done by creating defense committees or solidarity demonstrations. Rather than listen to or organize with rioters, all but the most radical tended to see Watts only as a race thing, failing to understand the links between revolution, anti-racism, and anti-imperialism, links that had been at the forefront of Black radical theorizing for decades and that were increasingly spreading through the Black freedom movement at large. And we see the same disjunction today where people don't see the political content of rise ups against police beyond being about race. They don't see how it intersects with class, how it's about property and power and all of these questions at once. It's not just a race thing. Race is the modality through which the demands are built. This narrative, however, also ignores the role that deployed US soldiers had in ending the Vietnam War. There was, uh, the soldiers in Vietnam were famously not happy, but we don't ever really learn about the extent of it. There was not only a rash of insubordination, of drug use, of desertion, and AWOL soldiers traveling all over Southeast Asia, um, and other forms of resistance to the war by soldiers who had been enlisted. Um, Anti-war action by soldiers uh, by the late 60s had evolved into a mass movement of fragging. Fragging is a military term for the practice of enlisted men murdering their officers in the field. Um, fragging spread throughout the US Army deployed in Vietnam. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Hundreds of officers were killed or put out of commission by their own men who refused to go out in patrols into the jungle and refused to continue uh, murdering Vietn Vietnamese citizens. Um, this, this movement of fragging and resistance brought the ground army to a point of almost total collapse and combined with a more capable North Vietnamese army was a decisive factor in the transition to Vietnamization, which was the, the military theory by which they pulled out all the ground troops and just sent over mostly air raids and napalm. Um, and eventually the loss of the US in the war and the end of the draft. The draft was largely ended because of this soldier resistance as much as anything else. Okay, but the point is not importantly, and I want to underline this again, that the most violent action is therefore the most serious or the most important. This is a common error that the Marxist Leninists and the various vanguardists and armed struggle sects of the 70s made that escalated physical violence is the only serious way to fight. They worshiped guerrilla warfare and terrorism and all could without hesitation quote Mao that power grows out of the barrel of the gun or that War is politics by other means and politics is war by other means. Um, this is not only a vicious way of looking at the world, um, it is also simply the bad opposite of the nonviolence worldview, which imagines that the presence or absence of violence determines the seriousness, power and possibilities of an action, right? So what I'm saying is that it is unclear whether the soldiers would have felt justified in fragging their officers if they didn't know that there was a mass movement of rejection at home. But if they hadn't fragged the officers, the mass movement of rejection might have gotten nowhere. These things all interact and work together. Of all the radical groups in the era, the Black Panther Party perhaps came closest to overcoming this contradiction, um, crucially because they spent most of their time building medical, food, and education programs. The guns, anti-police, and anti-repression work was certainly their most famous aspect and remains so, um, but hardly the most time consuming of their tasks. BPP cadre spent most of their time doing care labor, building community, um, and it's important here to note also, despite the vision of the Black Panther Party and Black Power as a militant and macho movement, two thirds of the Black Panther Party at its height was women. Um, which, which also can reflect some of its wisdom in, in attacking both at the carceral state and in the question of reproduction, health, feeding, education, right? Um, so uh, even still, even with all these facts, the fetishization of urban guerrilla warfare, um, which the BPP did, did exhibit in line, with the, <clears throat> in line with the other groups, led to an insistence on a militarized structure of command hierarchy within the organization that left the party incredibly vulnerable to snitches, to factionalization, to, and to internal power structures, which would eventually bring down the BPP along with repression, of course. All of which is to say, 
The philosophy of nonviolence was critiqued and ultimately disproven in the streets as a totalizing philosophy through the experience of the movements of the 60s, but most radically and powerfully by the Black Freedom Movement, which was always the heart of that struggle. After the movement was defeated in the early 1970s, a huge media, academic, and governmental project of falsification by a co-optation of Dr. King, Rosa Parks, and the movement uh, took place. It's, it's unfolding over decades. You still get it when the FBI and the CIA tweet out Happy Martin Luther King Day, you know, when, when right-wing capitalists tweet out Martin Luther King Jr. quotes to explain why people are working at their, you know, at, at their uh, stores that day, whatever it is. Um, we've seen this happen. Uh, it's become more and more vulgar as it's become more and more total. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. In the intervening years um, since the collapse of that movement, the violence of Jim Crow and segregation have been reorganized and reasserted through the prison industrial complex, through the war on drugs, through white flight and gentrification, through the uh, horrible movement of police lynching, through school policy and privatization, through welfare reform, and through the shattering of unions and labor protections. The result is now not only mass incarceration, which devastates most poor communities, but especially black ones, um, but also worse segregation in schools than there was in the 70s, um, just as, almost as bad housing segregation and lower income and worse employment numbers for black folks in America now, 60 years after you know, these, these events that we've been talking about. Um, but a key component in containing the movement has also been the growth of the nonprofit sector and its theories of change based on a mythologized and State Department approved narrative about the civil rights struggle. The activist industrial complex has proven again and again to be a wet blanket on the fires lit by black youth, prisoners, unhoused folks, queers, and the rest of us who fight for a better world and nonviolence is often its preferred philosophy of control. Over the last decade, the US has been in increasing states of upheaval and movement. Starting with the uprising for Oscar Grant in Oakland in 2009, through the student mood occupations in 2009 and 2010, the movement for Troy Davis, Occupy Wall Street, the movement for Trayvon Martin, Black Lives Matter in Ferguson, Baltimore, and the rest of the country, the prison abolition movement that has organized across prison walls, including a wave of prison strikes and riots in the last few years, the No More Deaths campaign and the anti-border struggles in the Southwest, Standing Rock and indigenous blockades and ecological action, trans liberation, spreading labor militancy, sex worker struggles, airport shutdowns, Occupy ICE, Me Too, the homeless encampment and the squatting movement. All of these movements have displayed a diversity of different tactics and different relationships to violence and not nonviolence. In the George Floyd uprisings of 2020, we saw the use of all the tactics developed in this decade, encampment, riot, strike, call out, blockade, looting, walkout, autonomous zones, highway shutdowns, as well as a deeper push against the police in the direct destruction of their infrastructures, of white supremacy, death, and control, in the destruction of their buildings, of their cars, and of their uh, materials. This is to say nothing of the reemergence of global struggle that has shaken every corner of this planet over the last 15 years. To continue to push narratives of nonviolence, would mean twisting or even rejecting the wisdom of millions of the people who have fought over the last decade for freedom in the United States alone. If we embrace nonviolence as the only real path to change, then we must see this decade of struggles as largely fruitless. We must misrecognize these contributions to abolition and to the possibility of a better world. If we embrace the nonprofit model of targeted policy change and small victories, then perhaps it does appear that the Trumpists are better organized than us and more ready, that there is no way to stop climate change, that our only hope goes through Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, that we must ask for the change that we so desperately need. But the change is ours to make. And if we can free ourselves from the ideological confusion created by decades of pure nonviolence and nonprofit activism models, we will be that much closer to devising truly liberatory and abolitionist modes and methods of resistance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicki. Um, the Q&A is just about to start. I'm going to help moderate questions. Um, and as usual, we're going to try to prioritize student questions. So if you want to make that a note in your question, you're welcome to put them in the chat. 
Um, to give everybody a moment to think, I'm going to selfishly ask my question, um, which Perfect. is, I'm really curious about how this focus on tactics and the efficacy of it um, seems to, uh, what you were talking about, it, people prioritize the moral superiority and the sense of justification to oneself over the actual overarching efficacy of tactics. Mm. And I'm curious how you see that factoring into other um, aspects of kind of like self-care, self-help, self -help, or other religious moralizing things. Um, so yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, and this is very, very, very ironic for um, someone who uh, wrote a book called In Defense of Looting. Um, but it was, it was a, you know, I think you're exactly right that the question of, a ta of tactics being asked in terms of their morality, or even in terms of their effectiveness, I think tends to um, be asking the wrong questions. And I think that that's also definitely true in terms of self-care. We've seen the sort of, you know, um, the development of a, of a you know, uh, people have taken on a quote from Audre Lorde, which says that, you know, that, that, that um, you know, under capitalism, Black women performing self-care is a revolutionary act, self-love is a revolutionary act. Um, that has come to stand in for a lot of different practices, um, many of which are, in fact, I think, necessary to us taking care of ourselves, um, necessary to us being able to fight. Um, and some of which are just things we should be doing because we want our lives to be good, right? Like, but don't have to, we don't have to justify everything through the morality of their politics. Um, and I think that that is one thing that um, I think we're often encouraged to do by Twitter and social media to sort of have to justify our, you know, our every desire, you know, our, the bad TV we like has to be politically astute and, you know, the face mask that we prefer, you know. Um, I think we could do a lot to, um, to, uh, I think we could do a lot to really begin um, thinking about just our desires and our pleasure, um, not, not trying to justify them politically, but to recognize that they already shape the way we think and we move and we act. And to, and to love that in ourselves, to love the part of ourselves that is perhaps scared, um, perhaps traumatized by decades of, you know, of, of of you know worsening ecological crisis and a pandemic, a year of a pandemic where we've all been inside, it's very reasonable for us to be upset and you know to find it hard to to know how to fight and to know how to move forward. In my experience, the people who who recognize how reasonable that is, the people who accept that we're you know on some level we're just animals trying to like make it and make the world better for our, the people we love and our loved ones, those people tend to have better longevity. Than the people who try to to insist that everything be politically excellent all the time and that they 24 hours of the day end up being activists and i think maybe all of us know some people who are like incredibly active and incredibly powerful and inspiring who are always writing and organizing and fighting um and 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 sometimes we beat ourselves up for not being able to beat those people not being able to be those people um i don't know if that quite answers your question but i think like i think like i'm trying to speak to sort of the way in which all of these things um, interact in ways that when we don't simply say, you know, is self-care good or bad? Is not nonviolence good or bad? Is some, you know, when we try, when we don't try and try and do that math, but instead say, okay, there's this movement in the streets. It's using these tactics. They're working this way. They're not working this way. How can we think about that? When we start from 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 you know, what, what, what Marxists would call a sort of materialist basis, right? When we start from observing the world around us um, and paying attention to the way that people are moving and fighting um, now and in the past, that's where I think a real possibility for, for, for good politics emerges. Thank you so much. Um, we have a student question now from Matthew. Um, he asks, uh, how do you think this conversation of not nonviolence um, factors into the realm of guns and gun control, monopoly of violence, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this one's, this one's pretty, uh, pretty like, there's a long story here, right? So modern gun control, as we know it, was invented in the 60s in response to the Black Panthers. Um, it was put forward by Republicans. Um, in response, in particular, Ronald Reagan, when he was governor of California, um, in direct response to the Black Panthers um, showing up armed on the states of the US Capitol building, right? So on the one hand, modern gun control um, and modern anti-gun politics is actually based in a sort of white supremacist um, sort of 
you know, politics, um, Ronald, of Ronald Reagan, right, and the NRA. Um, but then if you look at the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment is largely written in order to make sure that settlers have guns so that they can continue the constant and continuous, and continuous war on indigenous and black people that makes the nation possible, right? So the Second Amendment and the idea of militias was specifically that if there's, for example, a war breaks out with an indigenous tribe, which happened for the first 300 years of American history pretty consistently, then people would be armed and ready to fight, right? That was that the, the citizen soldiers would be available. Um, so, so uh, you know, and, and with with those with both of those caveats in mind, um, gun control does seem to be like an idea that thinks about the symptom. Um, that 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 thinks about the symptom of American white supremacy and settler colonialism, right? Um, I think we, you know, people people tend to think about these horrible mass shootings and they see them and they go, oh my God, people should not have assault rifles able to do that, right? Like that's horrifying. Um, but they don't see that the mass shootings of today are the direct, uh, the direct sort of what's the word I want, descendants of white riots of the early 20th century, of anti-indigenous violence and lynching of the 19th and 18th and 17th century, right? And like, so, so asking the question about gun control, I do think in general at this point, at this point, there are so many guns in American society and the vast majority of people who have them are people who, who I don't want to have them, <laughs> um, that who, who I think are against our goals, the, the people here on the call. Um, I think that fact means that gun control now is somewhat beside the point. The cat's a little out of the bag on some level. Um, you know what I mean? But I also think that, uh, but I do also think that, that um, armed self-defense was so crucial to the civil rights struggle. Um, and I think will in fact, in, and indeed be crucial um, to, to us moving forward if things continue to escalate. Um, I think we will need people to have guns, to be able to use them, to be able to defend us. Um, they were used in Ferguson. They were used in the riots this summer. People don't talk about it. They were shooting back at the police. There has been now for six years. There, people don't talk about it for, for a lot of obvious reasons. People in the movement don't talk about it because it, you know, it, it's intense to say we were shooting guns at the police. Um, police obviously don't talk about it because they don't want people to know that they were held back by live gunfire, um, which is the nightmare for the repressive apparatus, right? Um, so that is going to continue to happen. That said, personally, I don't think everyone needs to know how to use a gun or to have a gun. I don't agree with the 60s militants that, that the only way forward is armed struggle. I don't think urban guerrilla warfare is going to get us there. Um, so, you know, we'll see what develops. I'm not sure what will. I'm not sure what, what sort of tactics will be necessary. Um, I am personally grateful that some of my comrades are armed. Um, and ready to, to, to fight with arms if it comes to that. Um, I am also grateful that we are no longer obsessed with military maneuvers and guerrilla warfare um, as a movement. Thank you so much. I'm gonna combine a few questions that have been asked around the same gist. Um, this is from Joseph um, Walton, several of their questions and also from Patrick S. Um, both are asking about the, the efficacy of have of being involved in a movement where you personally are unwilling to commit um, non not nonviolent acts, um, but being in alignment with people who are willing to commit not nonviolent acts um, as a part of the movement, and how that can um, how that works at a personal level, but also how it could create challenges for recruitment to a larger movement. Sure. Um, so, with the first question, how it works on the personal level. Um, I think that is, I, so, you know, I, I sort of, I didn't say so much in the talk, um, but I, most of the things that we want to do, most of the things that, that are desirable um, are nonviolent, fall within what we would call nonviolence. That doesn't just mean marching, it means things like this event, talking to one another, feeding each other, taking care of each other when we're sick, protecting each other, housing each other, right? Um, there are so, so many important tactics that are um, that are so valuable that are nonviolent. I think there is, there is not a contradiction between being in a movement where you personally are frightened to do something, um, but other people around you are doing it. Um, I think 
I've certainly had that experience. I think everyone has had that experience where um, if, where, where some people are going to be doing some things that are more intense than what other folks are doing, right? It's sort of necessary and it's, it's always going to be part of the movement. And, but I think where the problem lies is if you believe that it is immoral to do not nonviolence, then you are a danger in the street to people who are, who are taking it on. And, and I'm gonna give some examples here from my own experience, okay? Um, I, the only times, and it's happened twice, the only times I have been physically threatened by another demonstrator has been when a nonviolent person, nonviolent person, um, at one point saw me, I was dragging a trash can into the street to try and block a police car that was, that was following us. Um, and this person grabbed me by the shirt and started screaming at me that like if I was being violent, you know, that their mom wouldn't get to work the next day. Um, so I think like if, if, if your idea of nonviolence is everyone has to be doing nonviolence all the time, then you can be a liability in the street. And because I have seen, I've, I saw um, in, in Brooklyn uh, during the, uh, the, the movement in 2013, this has preceded uh, Black Lives Matter um, around uh, the murder of, um, around a police murder. Um, uh, the, the, I saw white protesters saying to black teenagers who had just seen their friend killed, they were yelling, fuck the police. And this white protester yelled at them to shut up because it was violent, right? So if, if you believe personally that you don't want to engage in, non in, in not nonviolence, but you want to be in the street with people who do, okay, great, uh, that's awesome. Like come into the street, see how it goes, follow what you wanna do, learn from what you can learn and act the way you can act and the way you wanna act. Um, if you think that people acting not nonviolently are not part of the movement, stay out of the streets because you actually become a danger and a liability to the people. And I've seen, like I said, I've seen it happen. It's happened to me personally. You become a danger and a liability to people taking risks. Um, another thing that happens a lot that people um, is filming people a lot of people will film someone doing something not nonviolent, something illegal. And then if that person says, don't film me, I'm committing a crime, <laughs> right? Then the person gets very uppity and says, oh, well, I'm being nonviolent. And like, everyone should know what's going on. And this is public. That's a way that nonviolence leans into authoritarianism and leans into acting on behalf of the police because you're filming a crime. You're helping the police track down someone doing something that theoretically is on your side. So these are all questions that have to be asked. In terms of like, should you participate? Um, like, you know, I think people should, should, like I said in the previous question, should learn to listen to their own ethical and pleasurable calls and should learn to listen to, to what matters to them and to take that more seriously than any a priori question of tactics. Um, and, and I think that will give you the answer. So there are a number of questions um, that relate to um, the events and the burning of the third um, police precinct in Minneapolis. I'm going to yeah. start with Sarah's and then go back to some earlier questions. Um, Sarah asks about um, thought, your thoughts about how to push back against, uh, I believe they call it the rainbow capitalism that kind of um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the whole question so I don't get this wrong. Uh, what Sarah says, one thing that really bothers me and sometimes makes me feel insurmountable is the impenetrable hegemonic wall of narrative control and media control. How incredibly fast it seems to happen that flashpoints of liberationist action, like the burning of the third precinct, precinct get recuperated or propagandized away and memory hold. Do you have any thoughts on how we can push back against the recuperation and eraser of so-called rainbow capitalism, neoliberalism, socially liberal forces, et cetera, that, efficient, that so efficiently defang and gloss over liberationist struggle of all kinds? Thank you so much. That, that, that's like a big, the memory hole question, I think has become a really favored tactic. Um, and, it's, and it's used, you know, I said in the talk, it's used a lot by people on the left, um, people on the, on the social democratic left, um, in particular around the Bernie Sanders movement, would talk about how, you know, there was Occupy, then there was Bernie Sanders, and there was like nothing in between, and they would sort of ignore Black Lives Matter. But of course, it's much, much more prevalent among, as you said, the capitalists, the liberals, the media. Um, one thing we can do is we can constantly keep talking about it whenever we can, um, which I do, much to the annoyance of my friends and loved ones. Um, we can, um, we can, you know, uh, think and write you know, as I sort of opened in the book, we can think and write through 
what Sylvia Winter was talking about, about thinking with and through the movement, um, even when it's out of the street, even on things that don't seem like they're maybe directly related to the street movement. Um, you know, thinking in terms of like starting to understand cultural and social history through these inflection points. These are sort of, these are sort of abstract things we can do. Um, I also think um, in terms of the sort of memory holding, like, so one thing that I think about a lot um, is, and I'm gonna butcher this quote, but it's a quote uh, from Huey P. Newton in a speech he gave called The Correct Handling of the Revolution of a Revolution, um, in which he says, in Watts, and again, this is a paraphrase, in Watts, in the Watts riot, the property of the oppressor was destroyed to such an extent that the true nature of the black struggle in Watts was known and was communicated to every community in the country. The Minneapolis, the precinct did something very similar, right? I think as someone who's been arguing for police abolition for almost a decade now, the, the quickness with which police abolition became a real thing people could imagine in the face of that precinct being burnt down was actually incredible. It was truly incredible. It was like we bashed our heads against a wall for a decade and then suddenly there was no wall there at all and everyone was nodding with us, you know, and we were just nodding. It was incredible, it was beautiful. And the reason that happened is, is precisely because the material image of a police precinct burning, I think broke, it broke this deep ideological belief that the police are ahistorical, that they're undefeatable, that they're omnipotent, that they're omniscient, and that, that nothing can be done. And for, for, for one night in Minneapolis, people pushed them out of the neighborhood and lit their pig pen on fire. And everyone understood what that meant. It was incredible. It was an incredible message. So yes, then it does get memory hold, right? It gets memory hold by the series of, but I mean, you know, like, I also want to, like, give some credit where it's due to the uprising. Um, this was an election year. Elections are the most, presidential elections are the most effective anti-political thing in U.S. politics, in U.S. society. It's all we hear about for 16 months every four years. It's, it's, it's so deadening. And for three months, people did not talk about Donald Trump and Joe Biden. It was, it was beautiful. I loved it. So nice. It was such a nice summer as a result. Um, so, you know, I think it's complicated. I think these things do get memory hold. We do have to struggle to remember. We do have to talk about it. We do have to, we do have to analyze the way that that happens and analyze that stuff. Um, also, millions of people this summer participated in more intense action in the street than they ever had before. I think probably the largest, num largest actual number of people in American history participated in street action this summer. And if, like me, you have the, that experience of liberation and freedom in the street and togetherness, that feeling doesn't go away very easily. And I think there are millions of people who have forgotten nothing. And so maybe, maybe on some level, they're not thinking about it. It's not the forefront. The media narrative is dominated. It's back to elections, you know, all blah, blah, blah. But I think that feeling, that feeling of liberation, it doesn't go away. And folks from the 60s, Folks who were present in the riots and the, and the movement in the 60s still talk about it, talked about it in the 2000s, the 2010s. And you can see it, years melt off their face as they talk about it. They can be right back there. So I think that's incredibly powerful. And I think they can't memory hold that feeling. And I think we have that forever now. Thank you. So there's been a really, really fascinating chain that is currently still ongoing in the chat about um, Minneapolis additionally. Um, it started with Tack earlier asked a question about what we can learn from um, after you know the ousting of Donald Trump that the Minneapolis City Council has reneged on defunding promises and voted unanimously to give police an extra 6.4 million in funding. Yeah. Uh, and that's been followed up by some contributions from Michael and Patrick as well about interesting things about correlation and causation and um, the rises in violence um, in neighborhoods that were affected by the protests that occurred in Minneapolis. Um, and so I think the kind of the current question is how to square um, both the lack of uh, uh, fulfilling promises as well as the consequences of having um, violent activity or, and how directly linked those seeming consequences are to the actual um, not nonviolent activity. Absolutely. So, um, so for the for the last question first, um, I do not trust live crime statistics in general. Um, I don't. Uh, anyone who studies criminology um, will tell you 
that uh, increases in crime usually just reflect an increase in policing. It usually means the police are in those neighborhoods more often. Um, they're, they are, they're prosecuting harder. They are uh, looking for older cases. Um, so often when crime rates go up in the immediate aftermath, um, police can be doing that literally on purpose. Like they juice these stats, right? Like this is something they, they know how to manipulate as a media tactic. So on that question, like I'll leave that open. That said, I'm not saying I totally don't believe that that's possible either. I think it is quite possible that if a lot of businesses and neighborhoods are destroyed, that then like things end up being done um, less legally uh, in the uh, until that infrastructure can be rebuilt. I think that's possible. Um, I haven't experienced it like personally in Philly or anywhere I've been where those things have happened. Um, in terms of the uh, previous question about um, the effect on demands, I think this is a very interesting question, and I think it's I think we really. Um, I think I think we really need to think it through. I don't have an easy answer. I think it's really interesting that one of the ways that the movement of the '60s was defeated, other than the sort of long project of nonviolence and the and the and the carceral repression, um, was by just cash, right? Like the war on poverty and all these programs. Um, and some of that was demands. It was welfare. It was like one. But one of the things that happened was the federal government just pumped cash into cities, right? It wasn't enough cash to solve the problems. But it did often bring the movement into discourse with the bureaucracies, with, with, with government bureaucracies, as they had to sort of negotiate how to get that cash and how to manage it. it they built all these nonprofits, right? That, that's one way that they, one way they actually defang a movement is by partially meeting some of its demands, right? This is like classically, that's how you do it. And that's why movements work is because they give you what you ask for and you get out of the street, right? That's the, that's the theory. So we're in this period right now where the capitalists have in my opinion, the capitalist class is only unified enough to enforce no demands, like to give nothing, right? Um, which is interesting. Like that is that is a that is a show of strength and unity on their part to give nothing. But a cannier, a cannier political class, I think, would be giving us stuff, would be like working harder to like sort of defund the police. Or, you know, if you remember when that was all that discussion was going on, there was a lot of you know controversy, maybe you know in some circles about whether defunding would mean just being replaced by private police forces. Like no city has even tried that, right? Like there hasn't there hasn't actually been much reformist attempt at capturing the energy. Part of me thinks that's because the capitalists are genuinely confused. They're genuinely divided between like the Trump fash wing and the centrists who don't understand what's going on. Um, uh, that that's part of it. Um, part of it also is that maybe some of them, maybe the smarter ones, see that in March, in May, and June, when we had unemployment insurance and a stimulus check, we rioted, um, and that when we had money to do what we wanted, we rose up. I don't know. I don't know which. I don't know which narrative is dominant. It's probably a little bit of both um, on their part. Um, and then again, obviously, in terms of like local stuff, like. Here in Philly, we've actually had this huge series of wins around the housing struggle that came out of the riots, but the demands of the riots around like the political, um, around police funding hasn't really gone anywhere. Um, so I think, you know, it's a little too early. It's a little too early to tell. It's too early to tell. Um, it hasn't even been a year, um, but those are my original thoughts. And I think that's, that is exactly the right question, the right kind of question we should be asking, helpfully. <laughs> These are such wonderful questions. I'm just really enjoying it. I'm going to go back a little bit to Alana's question. Um, they asked, they said, a response I continue to see um, concerns a fear that violence is a doom tactic for us to use because our enemies are better equipped or more violent. Uh, what are the assumptions underpinning this argument that you would want to challenge? Yes, thank you. This is important. Um, so this is a very important distinction. And this is the kind of question that you can start to answer when you when you move beyond nonviolence, right? So that question imagines that the only thing that violence can look like is military struggle. Um, I agree. If we, if this moves into a military struggle, which is what I think the a lot of the 60s and 70s armed struggle groups were trying to do, if it moves into a militarized struggle, um, I think we will be in gra grave danger um, already. The reason is when you organize for a militarized struggle, you have to organize into an army. When you organize into an army, you necessarily have to build a huge 
logistical and hierarchical infrastructure of, of domination and discipline. Um, for a military to function, military officers have to have the right to murder their soldiers if they desert. It has to go up to that level of, of possible violence, right, um, and secrecy. If we militarize our struggles, then we have already begun rebuilding the state within our own movements. And I think that's a lot of what we saw in the 20th century revolutionary movements. I think that's one of the valuable lessons was that even these anti-colonial struggles and these um, you know, incredibly valuable and important you know, Marxist-Leninist and, and, and armed struggle and guerrilla and anti-colonial struggles, they formed armies that were then supported by one of the great powers. Those armies then took over um, and then went on and then became the new state. They became the new guy. At its best, that looked like pretty good social democratic reform um, or, or, or just socialist-ish reform like you get in Castro's Cuba, um, you know, with Nyerere. Um, at its worst, it looks like, you know, Cambodia. Um, most things were well in between those two, obviously. Um, but I think like, like we can never, never revolutionize society through a military struggle that takes over the state government, the nation state government. Violence though, not nonviolence as a tactic, as a mode of widespread um, disruptive attacking attacks on infrastructure, on the police and on workplaces, like say a massive general strike that also shut down a ton of infrastructure within the city and that fought the police, um, which would be, which wouldn't be nonviolent, but also could be decentralized, demilitarized, and still have street fighting and still have some of the things that we think about as like requiring a military. That's a struggle we can win. And we saw it this summer. Police were overwhelmed, right? Philly has one of the highest per capita police in the country, and they couldn't do anything for four days this summer because we were everywhere. There are more of us than there are of them. And we're in it for much more serious and important shit than they are. And so if, if, if we're big and we're distributed, um, there was a police report that came out recently from the New York, New York Police Department that said, we can very easily handle one 10,000 person march. We cannot handle 10 1,000 people marches, right? This is like, this is the, the, the terrain on which we should be thinking and fighting. So with that, there's a question that I uh, don't have it right on hand here, but Greg asked earlier about envisioning a future um, that is produced by not nonviolent means. And I'm curious about that in context of what you were just saying now um, in relationship with the lessons of different 20th, 20th century revolutionary movements um, and how there were instances where not nonviolent methods um, undermined the mm -hmm the goals that people were trying to achieve. Yeah, so, so um, I would argue that, that what undermined those, those goals in the 20th century was less the not nonviolent methods um, than it was a relationship to the state um, and, to, and to the party form in particular um, as the way to capture the state. I think that the insistence on the uh, Leninist party that captures the state and then stands in for the working class. It's substitutionist theory is what it's called um, that, uh, that, that Lenin sort of practiced. Um, the, you, and, and, you know, um, I'm a huge, I'm a huge horrible history nerd, but like, you know, during 2017, it was the century anniversary. I read like 15 books about the Russian revolution. Like it's really important that we study these things. Um, and, and one of the things that I think that happens in those movements, it's not that it's not nonviolent. It's that it sees the task of the revolutionary to stand in for the people, to organize the power of the state, um, to give the things that the people need, um, and that, that that is the process of revolution and socialism, right? So that, that theory of, of state control, violent or nonviolent, I don't think will ever work. Um, in terms of like what the world would look like, um, I have no idea. Um, I, I, we can't know. We are all so deeply steeped in this ideology and we've, been, we've, we've grown up in the society and we're all so shaped by it and changed by it. And, and it's so hard to know what, what even I would look like under those circumstances, let alone what society would look like. Um, I think the place to look 
um, for glimpses, though, um, outside of a riot um, or outside of a protest zone. Um, I think uh, the practice of marunage um, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, maroons, uh, slave communities that formed after escaping the plantation, um, show us some of that. I think in Reconstruction in the 1870s, some of the communes that formed, some of the socialist experiments that were taken up in the Reconstruction give us some, some images of what that might look like. Maybe the Paris Commune is one people like to point to. Um, you know, uh, I think there have been a lot of different communities of, of struggle. Um, I also think studying uh, both indigenous North American, but also just generally indigenous life ways in, in the Southern hemisphere, um, give us ideas about the many, many different ways that life can look like um, without capitalism, without value and without domination by hierarchy. But again, those are just glimpses and, and, we'll and, 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 I don't, and I don't know. I hope I'm getting this right. I think it's a G. Um, Inga asked a question um, about, um, they said this past summer, the Minneapolis PD and the city often took the tactic, which you mentioned of blaming riots on the white supremacists. Um, and then asks how we, how you imagine that we could consider, um, we can effectively counter this narrative. Mm. Oh, I hope no one would ask this. This is a million dollar question. Thank you so much, Inga. Yeah, it's so hard. Um, I'm not sure. I, I wish I had a good answer. I, I'm not really sure, except that, except to all I've been doing so far has been responding with total hostility to that argument wherever it appears. Um, I think, you know, I think that I, I think that you're totally right that that um, that argument has proven much more effective than the usual arguments about nonviolence. Um, uh, and I think, interestingly, the question of nonviolence is becoming less relevant as that, as the sort of idea of like secret Nazis um, sort of becomes the one, you know, there's these uh, infiltrators, outside agitators. Um, I give a lot of arguments, counter arguments to this in my book, uh, not to plug it mercilessly. It is free on the internet. You can find it for free in the intro. Um, I think like one thing that we can talk about though, and one thing we can think about is that the, the white supremacist claim is also old. Um, it, it goes back to the outside agitator narrative, um, which was so effect, which was used on the plantation, right? Um, slave owners said that, uh, or excuse me, enslavers said that uh, northern uppity uppity northern agitators were giving their the people who were enslaved on their plantations ideas, and that's why they were rising up in such high numbers so consistently. Um, Martin Luther King was an outside agitator. Um, famously. He traveled the country. People hated him for that. And white people hated Martin Luther King, it's also important to remember, while he was alive. He was wildly unpopular. Nonviolence, while it was ongoing in 62 and 63, was seen as moving way too fast by white liberals all over the country. They were against the civil rights movement. When the riots started, they started going, whoa, 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 bring back the nonviolence. Um, so, sorry, that's a, that's a aside. The point is, like, I don't know exactly how to combat it, except to point out that it's the same, it's the same sort of conspiracy thinking right now. This is where I'm at right now. Is like it's the same conspiracy thinking as QAnon. It's the, it's 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 right wing paranoia that these that these that these things are being started by outside agitators. And if you call them white if you call them white supremacists or you call them white anarchists, which is what they were calling them in Ferguson and Baltimore, or if you call them you know whatever, it's sort of the same slander in the end. Um, and I think maybe pointing that out, pulling through some movement history, thinking about how this is really structurally the same claim, maybe that starts to point to rhetorical strategies against it. So the next question Patrick just asked, um, beyond the poles of strict nonviolence and the end justifies the means, what are the criteria by which these social movements should choose tactics? And if I can personally tack on to that question, which is, the wording I've been looking for for like the last 15 minutes. Um, I'm really curious about how the, that criteria can be established in a, in a non-prescriptivist manner. So that's, that's, that's exactly, I think, that, I think this is the heart of the, heart of the, the discussion here and, and the problem with nonviolence as an ideology is that it thinks you have to make a list of tactics ahead of time um, and think about that as the question of the movement. Historically, that has, I mean, maybe it's happened. It's happened a few times, I guess, probably. But historically, what happens is people go out in the street and they start experimenting with trying to get what they want. 
and tactics emerge immediately and and spontaneously from that experience, right? Um, and then and then those can develop or codify into broader strategies, into broader ideas. But we can't, we cannot sit and judge tactics, good or bad, um, before before there is a context of a movement, right? And like once there is the context of the movement, then I think we start to talk about effectiveness. Then we start to talk about like what effects does it have? Does it win our demands? Does it, you know, like what does it look like? What are the effects that it has? What, um, how does it make us feel to do it? Does it, does it, you know, does it involve us being more disciplined and hierarchical, or does it involve us being able to act more openly on our desires? Um, you know, being honest and forthright and thinking through the experiences we've just gone through is how we come to these answers. And I think you can see that, you know, what I, what I mentioned at the very end of my talk um, in, in the 2020 uprisings, um, we saw so many, like we saw occupations like from Occupy come back, right? We saw Me Too style callouts going on around racism online um, and in different scenes where they hadn't been happening before. Um, so like, you know, there's these, there, these, these nonviolent tactics that were developed, like reproduce and, and come up as they prove themselves useful in the process of struggle. So often what ends up happening is people who then join the struggle as activists, as, as comrades, as whatever, people who join this struggle then think they know best what to do and try to, try to make it happen try to make what they want to happen happen um, by, by controlling the movement rather than doing the thing they want to do. I think if we learn to start thinking about in groups, affinity groups maybe, um, groups of people, they don't have to be organizations, thinking about what do we want to do? What do we want to do today? What would we like the power to do? <clears throat> How can we begin moving towards that? Asking those questions rather than what tactics would we like to get there? Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll very often, very often uh, yield better, better tactical answers. That leads almost perfectly into the question that Greg just asked, um, which is about the, how a movement prepares for this spontaneous development you were just talking about. And so I'm curious about what you see as effective bodies or groups who are having those conversations about what they want and good formats for having those conversations, the types of communication between different entities who are having small discussions that leads to preparation to then in the moment, um, mm. uh, not judge, but um, strategize about different tactics. So yeah, so in my experience, um, the um, and again, this is this is my personal experience um, over you know a decade. Like I've been doing this for way too long. I'm getting old, but um, but also like but also this is just personal experience. Um, the more we try to formalize those groups, um, the less likely those groups are to survive in a helpful way, um, moving into the next wave of struggle. What tends to happen is that. We use in, in the moment, whatever sort of thing is available to us. Um, we use whatever is available to us. It becomes incredibly useful and um, incredibly effective when we all have a shared goal. And then as soon as the movement moves out of the streets, in my experience, again, um, the more formal a group is, the more and the more formalized it recognizes its existence as being political the more likely it is to run into really serious burnout. So one thing that happens that, that I think we don't talk about very much, um, that your question about self-care Rosie really brings up, but we don't talk about it, is the street, when you're in the street in the middle of a social movement, you feel like you have to win. It's part of what makes it effective. You believe that you can win. It's necessary. No matter how old I get, I have never lost that naivete. I think I've lost it, the movement starts, then I'm like, oh shit, this is it. Like we're winning this time. It happens every time, right? I think it's really valuable. I think that naivete is really valuable. Um, but then we don't, we lose. We leave the streets. We leave this reason to be together all the time. We leave, we lose this, this, this constant and, and togetherness and this, this, this shared vision. And we are filled with despair. We are just, we are just overwhelmed with sadness. Um, and, and the loss of this dream, 
and the loss of this beautiful thing. And that, and what I've seen happen is people lash out at the people closest to them who were, who were with them in the street. The people who were with them in the street, it's their fault. They didn't fight hard enough. They did the wrong thing. They were creeps. They were jerks. They weren't really kind. In the end, I didn't want to work with them at all. This isn't to say that we can't have falling outs and that like the, the like people who are problems in our communities don't need to be addressed and dealt with, they do. But post-movement despair, as I call it, is the greatest killer of organizations, <laughs> the greatest killer of modes of organizing. And the organizations that I've seen withstand post-movement despair have tended to do so by churning their membership, right? So I think we've seen this a lot, like local groups, they recruit out of college, people are in it for one or two years, they have a bunch of demos, and then they, people, you know, move in and out of it, and, you know, whatever, you know, they, they churn, they churn, they churn membership, but the sort of top stays sort of the same. Those groups, in a moment of social activity, in my experience, tend to be small c conservative because they've learned over months or years of a lull period that the way that they survive is by recruiting and protecting the thing they have. So they get very good at protecting a thing they have, which is a defensive struggle. They get very, very good at, at keeping one thing together uh, against all odds. But what a social movement requires is that everything be sacrificed to grow it, to take it the next step, that nothing, nothing is being held together. In fact, everything is being exploded everything we thought possible, we're pushing past it. We're pushing past it. We're breaking through walls that we once imagined were, were, were impenetrable, right? And as a result, the tendencies that we build, if we organize during a lull period on the basis of hold together, defend, those organizations, in my experience, are reactionary in the street because they have only learned how to recruit, how to churn, how to, how to, how to capture, how to hold not how to push, how to throw, how to smash, which is like what needs to be doing when a movement is growing. Um, and we can also see this tendency in a smaller way when we look at occupations or encampments. Um, this often happens that when the encampment is growing, it's very, very exciting. Um, it's, everything seems possible. And then it starts trying to organize itself infrastructurally and it like forms a security committee and people start tracking all the donations. And before you know it, you're like in a weird bureaucratic, um, you're in a weird bureaucratic zone where before you were sort of in an anarchic space of encounter, right? Um, so I think, was any of that an answer? I don't know. I guess like, I guess like uh, informal, informal discussions, chat groups, um, reading groups, not trying to commit too much to any one group, but trying to maintain relations of interest and shared desire. Um, I think that's, that's the trick. So since that was so wonderful, it was really helpful. And I, since no one else has asked another question, I'm going to take the last one um, very greedily, um, which is that you talked about this lull period and the different types of thinking that emerges um, out of people who are trying to hold together interest when there's not this profound amount of change and people who are, are capitalizing on that change. And I'm curious about, especially considering the links between activism and documentation of information or activism and just very, very tedious, monotonous bureaucratic work, um, how, 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 what the need is for groups that do, um, that, that persist and are able to continue over a long time, how those groups, how necessary those groups are to the, to the, to helping facilitate change, mm -hmm. and thus with those groups, how much you know people who are shifting thinking and and, and not using typical methods, um, and are kind of capitalizing in protests or in writing, how those groups need to reach out to people who are facilitating like the very very gradual change that helps support larger moments of change. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I, I really appreciate it. And I, I just want to thank everyone. I can't believe y'all wanted to hang out with me for two hours. I'm so honored. Thank you so, so much for having me and for and for holding me in this in this Zoom call. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to be all together in person um, as ever. Um, so yeah, so thank you. Um, because I'll, once again, on a roll, I'll stop. I'll stop. You know, then I'll, then I'll forget that I want to do that. Um, so thank you all again so much. So lovely to see your faces and your names. Um, I, um, 
So I think it really depends, frankly. There's a bunch of organizations in, in Philly, I won't name them, that I think we would have been better off if they hadn't existed, if they had failed, if they had fallen apart. There are other ones that I think have definitely helped um, in those small ways. Those small things do help. Again, though, you know, you described it as really tedious, really boring work. I don't think people should be doing that work if they find it really tedious and boring consistently forever. I mean, obviously, sometimes you're going to do one thing that's a little tedious and boring, like it happens. But I think we we really should like if 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 every day you're like fuck this activism work I got to do again. If you're saying that every day for a month, get out because it's not going to work. You're you, we cannot we cannot build a movement um, that really function creates change by by sucking our activists dry of any ability they have to 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 love the reasons they came there in the first place. Um, I think a lot of activismism, as I think of it, um, activismism or militantism fetishizes being serious, fetishizes working hard, fetishizes sacrifice. Fuck that. Absolutely not. No. We like doing the things we do and we do them because we like them and we like the effect they have. Some of that work we don't like, but, but everyone who continues doing it on some level either likes it or likes the feeling of being a saint that they get from it or whatever. I think if we like the feeling we get of identity, of like identifying with sacrifice and identifying with being an activist and being a being, you know, on the right side of history and and being good and, and righteous, that tends to be a dangerous impulse in my experience. People who 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 operate on that level of identity with activism tend to trend authoritarian in my experience. People who are like, you know, I love the people I work with, but I hate some of this work we have to do. Those people can like consistently build good work over time um, and they have some stomach for it. But also if you find yourself unable to find a way to plug in that feels good, keep looking. Don't just force yourself into whatever widget you know, whatever, whatever space you can find. Um, I think it's very common for people to be like, the first thing they find, be like, yes, like that's, finally, I found something. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm speaking with 10 years experience. So like, how would anyone else who's starting like have that experience? Like they wouldn't. So, um, but like, I think like, like we just have to operate from as much of a position of self-love and self-knowledge and self-trust and trust of our friends and comrades in our community as possible. And we have to like, and, and, and we have to listen to ourselves and our feelings. And that is like so important. It's so important. It's, it's this piece of feminist theory and queer theory that I so consistently see not being included, you know, um, in, in even when people are sort of being inclusive of this stuff. These levels of, of, of genuinely caring about ourselves and one another. Um, are so important um, and and are instructive. And you know, I've watched people, some of the be the best organizers or whatever, whatever you want to call them, the best people I've ever met at doing this over a long period of time, they are really good at saying, honestly, right now I'm burnt. I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a few weeks just like doing my day job and like or like months or months or whatever. I'm taking a break. I'm not doing this. Like I'm I'm just taking a break. Like I'm stepping back. Um, I'm staying, you know, I'm keeping my relationship with friends going. Those people are, are much, much better than, um, than people who, who force themselves into it. Those people burn out, those people hurt each other, those people hurt themselves. Um, and we always, you know, and I'm gonna say it again, there's always a perfect activist you have in your mind. When I say the most impressive activist, I imagine there's someone who jumps into your head. If you're like me, maybe there's four people. I, there are four people. And, I don't understand where they get the energy. I have no idea how they do it, but I have accepted that I am not the same as them and that I do not get have the energy and I do not get the pleasure from doing all that fighting constantly as they do. And, that, and, and, and accepting that has made it so much easier for me to interface with the movement how and as I want to, when I want to. Um, and that's, yeah, uh, that's, so that's my advice, I guess, for now. <laughs>
Thank you so much, though. I think that was a really wonderful uh, last note to end on. Um, that wraps up the talk. Um, if everyone could thank Vicki again, it was such a wonderful talk. And it was, thank you all for coming. Thank you all.